Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Everything you know about this guitar is a complete lie. Today, we make Gibson history and finally talk about the truth behind this mysterious 1986 Gibson Les Paul with this Explorer headstock. If you're a rare guitar hunter like I am, and you fall in love with the 80s, you can find some really freaky weird stuff out there. And this has to be my number one guitar that I like the best. Because just look at this thing! It's ridiculous! You get three humbucker pickups, you get a mirrored pickguard stock, a TP6 tailpiece ABR1 bridge, pure white finish with the custom binding on the front, the dot inlays took a little bit for me to get used to, but now I do like them. But the biggest thing is the headstock with, get this, the raised Gibson logo, just like the old Flying Vs had. In my eyes, this is the Gibson equivalent of the Gretsch White Penguin because nobody knows exactly why they were made, but they're kind of fancy and collectors pine for these. So let's do a little backstory. Most people, when they first find out that these things even exist, it's because they run across a photo that Neil's Guitars posted on Reverb when they had one of these seven years ago. And up until very recently, those were like the only good photos of one of these guitars that you could ever find. So it was just a complete mystery because it's the only one that had any documented proof. And apparently there was one on a Guitar Trader magazine that you can also see within that guy's photos. But just very recently, in late 2020, two more of these things showed up pretty much back to back. There was one that was super beat up and aged and yellow that kind of briefly got famous on Instagram. I had people sending me that thing every day. It's like, yes, I can't wait until they list it because I want that guitar. And then a more minty one showed up, which was this one. And unfortunately I missed it the first time it came up for sale. If you want to learn the backstory of how I actually got this guitar, check out my unboxing video for that. Through extensive research online, I was able to find two other ones. One of them had to be completely refinished because somebody ruined it. Look at this. They took the finish off the top, they stained it like a mahogany color. And then the back, they had the bright idea to put a bunch of moon and stars. So the owner of that one got it dirt cheap and they had it refinished to match the original finish back on the neck. So that's kind of a butchered example, but at least now it looks semi what like what it was supposed to originally. And there's a viewer of my show that also owns one of these. He sent me some photos. So I can say without a doubt, I've actually seen six of these. And in these listings, people say that there's approximately 25 of these. Now, keep in mind, people are just pulling that number out of their butt. There's no documented evidence of that anywhere. However, I was able to get the serial numbers of every single one except for that refinished. And they are all the exact same. They'll have one of these custom shop edition decals on it which means it was a limited edition, not a custom shop guitar. A custom shop didn't formally exist the way we know it today until late 1993. This simply just meant it was a limited edition guitar. And there's also another one that says custom shop original, meaning it was a one-off. So that tells us, yes, there was a run of these guitars. But they all start with 821865. And then the last two digits tells you the production. The earliest one that I've seen ends in 541. And the highest number that I've seen is 548. So that means there are at least eight that I know of as of today in late 2020. Maybe this video will get some more to surface and we can compare the numbers there. But I really think 25 of these being made is way too high of a number. I think at most it's 10. But at the same time, I could see eight being a nice round number that they would stop at. So that's my best educated guess there. But what a strange day at Gibson, August 6th, 1986, when at least eight of these weird, bizarre things were created. But the biggest problem with tracking these guitars and selling them online is nobody knows exactly what to call this model. And I am happy to finally say I do have the Custom Shop Gibson official name for this guitar. And I'm really proud that I was able to actually figure it out myself. So the first thing that everybody calls this thing is the Aldo Nova model. I want to be very clear, and if you learn nothing else from this video, this is not an Aldo Nova model. Please, please, please stop calling this guitar that because it's not. 
This is the Aldo Nova Les Paul. The only thing these guys have in common is they are Les Paul shaped and they have Explorer head stocks. This is an equally as rare guitar, if not even rarer and more desirable, but we will be talking about this in a couple of weeks, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss this very good episode. There's a lot of backstory to this one. And how do I know that this isn't an Aldo Nova signature model? I asked him. He said, no, I did not have anything to do with that guitar. Those are all fake. So if you own one of these guitars, this is actually a custom boutique. Nah, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> okay, so Aldo thought these were all fake. And the story behind that is he tried to purchase one of these a few years ago. And essentially there was a guy catfishing one of these things, trying to get somebody to send him money and he didn't actually have the guitar. He broke down and told him that it's fake. So I'm really hopeful that one day he does get one because you know, it's kind of inspired off of his design. I'm sure it had something to do with these things being created, but for first Further proof that these are not fake. I tracked down the original Gibson employee who had his hand in the pile of these guitars. If you ever open up an early to mid 80s guitar and you take a look inside your back control cavity, sometimes right along up in here you'll see the signature RFL or FL. And those were the initials of a father-son team, RFL being the son, and he's still with us. And thankfully, he's very active on guitar forums, especially on Facebook groups, and I've now chatted with him via email. I really hope to go down and meet him maybe at like the next summer NAM, and we'll do a nice interview with him because he is a wealth of information for my favorite era of Gibson because he was actually there and he's got the photos and he's got the ledgers of everything that he worked on. And he only put those initials in the best of the best. So I asked Randy, hey, do you have any of these in your little booklet? Is there any official name? Do you know how many were made? And unfortunately, he only has one in his book. But remember, he's just one guy. There were also other guys. And the one in his book is that 548 number, the highest one that I found so far. But here is where I finally solve the mystery and make Gibson history. What is this thing called? Be prepared, it's gonna shock ya. This is the Gibson Les Paul Studio Custom XPL. Ah oh, man, it's a studio. Come on, I spent five figures on a studio. <laughs> Yep, that's what it was. As soon as I took this thing out of its case, I knew this had to be a studio custom because the body is thinner than a regular Les Paul. Let's compare it to that studio custom I got to end out Trey Tuesday season three. So first off, you're going to notice the binding is only on the top and it's a multiply binding. So it's like a Les Paul custom, but the backside does not have it at all. And again, it's that thinner body width about 1.8 inches instead of the two inches thick. Now, wouldn't have this been cool if this was like the precursor to the custom light? Nah, it's not as thin. <laughs> I wish, I wish. But basically, they've just added this third pickup in the middle. They've given it this fancy pick guard and the TP6 tailpiece with ABR1 bridge. And once again, the headstock is an Explorer shape. But the most peculiar thing about this one is that raised Gibson logo. The fretboard has the single ply binding, just like the Studio Custom, and you get the dot inlays. Some Studio Customs and Studio Standards got ebony boards like this one has, but most did not. So that's kind of something that, eh, is it the same or not? I guess we don't really know. And as of right now, I'm not sure if it's made of the same body materials or not. I mean, you can take a look at these things right here. They are pretty well spec the same. And if you're not familiar with what XPL is, that was a big thing in the 80s. It basically was just a shortening of the word Explorer. Gibson would take the Explorer headstock and just put it on every single model. That's how you got things like this, the double cutaway Les Paul XPL. We'll see this in a later review and demo as well. But you could also find that headstock on the Spirit guitars, Flying Vs, which I'm a big fan of. You could even find an XBL Explorer, which we did a review on. Yeah, how do you put an Explorer headstock on an Explorer and call it special? Well, you change it up to the Meat Cleaver. 
So this was just an ending version of one of those, because you gotta remember, the studio customs were discontinued in 1985 potentially early 86. So I guess it would make sense that they might have a couple of studio custom bodies laying around that they need to use up somehow. So that's my best guess as to how this thing was birthed. But at the same time, they might've just been like, hey, let's do this because they did a bunch of crazy stuff in the 80s. And that's why it's my favorite era of Gibson. It's funny how I used to be scared of 80s Gibsons when I read, you know, internet lore when I was first getting into guitars, but it's very quickly became my favorite. So there we go. You can finally call it something. This is the Gibson Les Paul Studio Custom XPL. It's a little bit more special than all the other XPLs. So I'm just happy that we finally have a real name and that's the official name that was in his ledgers for it as well. So call it nothing else. It is not an Aldo Nova model. It's the Studio Custom XPL. So I hope your troglodytes enjoyed getting to learn about this thing. But of course, we can't just stop there. We need to take a deep dive. Let's go ahead and throw this thing on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs and then get to that playing demo. Inside the Studio Custom XPL, man. Never thought I would have this guitar on my workbench, let alone actually discover its true identity. But let's go ahead and take a look at this thing. So starting off here, we get triple Tim Shaw PAF humbuckers. These are towards the end of their production, so they do not have the date stamps like some of them will in the earlier years. Between early 1980 all the way until about 85, so 86, 87, you can still sometimes find them. But just these three pickups right here are worth quite a bit of money all on their own, let alone being inside this really rare guitar. But we can take a look in here, and this guitar's name is Bernice which we used to speculate was actually a secret grading system. You can find many different women's names in here. However, I was actually just reading that's how people would get credit back in the day for their work. To make sure they're meeting quota, they would put their name in there. But thankfully, we do have some areas where the finish did not come over it. So it does appear to be a maple top with a mahogany body. And if you get it in the light just right, I don't think I'll be able to see it here. But, but I was able to see it at one point in time when I had this guitar. It is a three-piece maple top. And we can also verify with that one that somebody, thankfully, in this case, stripped the top so we could see it. So three-piece maple with a mahogany body. This has definitely been nine-hole weight relieved because that's just something that they were doing at this point in time. And it is a short neck tenon, so nothing goofy there. The middle pickup here, something I want you guys to really notice is just how deep this channel is. And you might also be saying, oh my gosh, what disgusting pickup cavities. That's not dull router bit stuff, that's just the vintage buffing compound that's just been in these cavities forever. I'm going to go ahead and leave it alone. I mean, I could clean it off. I mean, they've even got some up here. I thought it was absolutely hilarious that there's even still some right here on the binding, but it was just covered over by the pick guard so they never finished taking it off. So I'm, I'm just gonna leave it there because man, it's been there for such a long time, but what a cool look inside here. Doesn't look like anybody's gone rogue and taken the pickup covers off either. But unfortunately, one of the pickup rings has cracked. I'm not going to do anything to re-glue it because it still works and functions just fine. And most of the times it actually just kind of clicks into place. But that's kind of what I was alluding to in the unboxing episode. These plastic pickup rings feel really brittle. You can actually start to see a small fracture right here. So eventually we are going to lose the bottom of this pickup. That's very common in the late 80s and early 90s. That's going to be a sad day. Another unique feature to this guitar is the outer screws are actually gold. Normally they're black. So that is something incredibly special, believe it or not. But the pickup covers themselves, they do show some wear right here and there, and then mainly right here. So somebody was definitely one of those players like me that likes to anchor right there. And then maybe they had their pinky up here like that. But they definitely took very good care of this thing. And now when we get to the bridge, here's where things get interesting. Okay, so I told you earlier, it's an ABR1 bridge, right? Yeah, they all have them. The gold is in fantastic shape on this. And it is the same branding that you would find in this era if they had a Gibson ABR1. Check out the last Kalamazoo made custom I reviewed. You can see the same thing there. Notice the black spacers, that is factory stock. Continuing down here though, is where things get strange. It's not mounted historically. 
Why did they do that? So we can't actually call this one a prehistoric because it doesn't have a true ABR1 bridge mounted in the traditional way, just drilled into the top without studs. This one's got the studs and it does not have an ink stamp serial number. So no, this is not a really strange prehistoric. <laughs> but get this, TP6 tailpiece. These were pretty well on their way out at this point in time. I mean, Gibson still makes these things yet today, but these were a Rendell Wall creation. You can find them in the early 70s until about the mid 80s stock on some very fancy models. The way that it works is you put the strings ball end right here, like so, and then that pulls that lever up here. And then this fine tuner, as you tighten it down, it moves that lever down so that actually changes the pitch of the string. Now on a guitar like this, that doesn't have a Floyd Rose or super tuned Vibrola Kaler type thing, it's kind of worthless. It just looks really cool. <laughs> But there are some people that like that they can fine tune it like a violin. This one's actually in pretty clean shape and the back it just reads Gibson made in USA. One of the few parts that Gibson actually made themselves or at least had within the USA. Everything else was pretty much Schaller made. Moving on from here, let's take a look at the switch tip and poker chip. These are an extremely crisp white color, like they really stand out. And that's partially because, you know, the finish has aged a little bit but they all have this exact same phenomenon going on. This is a brighter white than most switch tips in this era. So I think this is actually uh, something very special just for this guitar that they ordered. And again, here we can see the multiply binding along just the top, just the top. And then we move on over here to our knobs. These look suspiciously modern day, don't they? Well, that's because in mid 1980, Gibson changed ownership. This is technically not a Norlin era guitar because that changed hands at the very end of 1985. So this is technically a Jeskowitz era guitar. But for all intents and purposes, nothing had changed at that point in time. So it's kind of Norlin, but not. But anyways, they changed what the knobs were made out of, so they don't actually age anymore. It's kind of sad. They, they might age a little bit, but they don't age the same as like the 70s knobs. So seeing something like this is not that uncommon, though it would have been cool to see them age a little bit. But now moving on here, you can see uh, where the pick guard left a little bit of an impression. And then this was either a careless dealer or it just happened at the factory, a double screw hole for your pick guard. And unfortunately it does sit crooked but I wanna take a look at this pick guard. This is really neat. In all my years of looking at this guitar online, I never once realized this was a mirror pick guard. And the back, it's like this like light gray material. On the other side of that is the reflective surface. And then to me, it appears to be a clear plastic that's slightly tinted gold. That kind of gives it this color. I don't think I've ever seen that on another Les Paul or Gibson guitar. I'm sure they might have used it on something else, but this is the only one that I can think of. And man, does that just look kind of cool. Now, I'm really curious to see how this is wired up. I'm hoping it's just like a regular Les Paul Custom. But yes, these are definitely Tim Shaw's. 7.84k ohms in the bridge. Your neck position, about 7.75, so these are really good readings. And our middle position, yes! So that's going to be these two pickups combined in kind of like a single coil-esque sound. I love three pickup Gibsons that just have a simple three-way toggle. I'm not a big fan of the blending stuff. I would rather just have three selections and go. So that's a big win in my book, but probably a downfall in other people's eyes. And I guess now that we're looking at it here in the light, you can see some light cracks within the shafts of these plastic pots. Very common. And I wouldn't say the knobs are loose, but maybe I could uh, take those off and tighten up the washers. Everything seems to be loose on this guitar for some reason. Moving on from the maple top and the mahogany body, a beautiful ebony fretboard. I know I just recently told you guys this, but the only time that I enjoy dot inlays is when they're true mother of pearl, which these ones are, and you have binding on the neck. This looks fantastic to me. Now I had somebody in the comments section saying, oh man, I wish that had trapezoid inlays or custom block inlays. And I agree, it probably would have been pretty cool. I would actually prefer the quirkiness of the standard inlays. But in order to be the studio custom XPL, they couldn't mess with the dot inlays. So it's kind of cool. It's its own quirky vibe. I mean, if it was just the custom blocks, everyone would just think it's a custom. So I guess I'm glad they didn't do that. So it's either dots or trapezoids for me. And you know, I'm glad it's different. And of course we still have the fret nibs and the ebony fretboard's just gorgeous on this one. 
As far as our next specs go here, we get a... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Excuse me. 1.73 inch nut width. That's actually a pretty chunky nut width for a Gibson. Usually they're like 169-ish. But by the 12th, it's about regular 2.06. I noticed this neck is pretty chunky. First fret neck depth, 0.81. And then by the 12th, 0.98. Like, it's a rather rounded neck. It's not Super 50's big baseball bat, but for this particular era, this is a chunky neck, which would be kind of considered medium in today's territory. That was a nice surprise to me. And now our beautiful headstock. This went through two dealers without anybody disclosing that the truss rods essentially maxed out. Thanks, guys. <laughs> However, it looks like it left the factory like that. I mean, it's not completely maxed out, but having threads sticking out that far, not necessarily a good thing. Got a good quarter inch yet before it actually needs reset or anything, but due to all the paint on there, I'm going to guess it left the factory like that. So, yeah, maybe that's just how that particular truss rod needed to be set. All I've got to say is, thankfully, the neck is perfectly good, nice and straight. It doesn't actually need any adjustment. So we don't even have to worry about that non-issue at this point in time. I love the way that the inlays have aged like a yellowish tint. You don't see that too often. And unfortunately, we cannot see through this finish to see if this is a maple or a mahogany neck. But I'm going to guess it's mahogany. Because if you just look right in that screw hole, you can kind of see the mahogany color. But who knows, maybe one day one of these will show up that has some neck wear and we can 100% verify it. But man, do I love that gaudy Gibson logo. Especially on a Les Paul, because there's only one other Les Paul that you could get that on previously to this. That wasn't even done until the late 2000s, so the fact that we can get an Explorer with that on here, with the Les Paul body, man, we're just having a lot of fun with this one. But no locking tuners or anything fancy on this guy. They're just Grovers, but my heart would have completely stopped had they had put the Clusons on here, because that's my favorite thing about vintage Explorers, is the Cluson tuners. It just looks so retro. And the truss rod cover itself appears to be made out of brass, not the plastic material like the pickguard is made out of. That would have been cool if they would have did a brass pickguard, but it probably wouldn't have aged too nicely, so probably better in the long run to do that plastic material reflective way. Now who would have ever thought they would get to see the inside of one of these? So unfortunately, the back plates, I'm surprised they didn't go for the same reflective material that they used for the pick guard. That would have been kind of cool. But no, just regular black back plates as they normally did. No shielding or anything like that because they've got this little shielding cage right here. But this is when they went back to using a traditional ground wire. You can see that coming through there. And the pots date to 1986, the 15th week. And everything looks pretty well untouched for this one. So the way that they wire up their three pickup guitars, I think you get the neck pickup on here and the bridge just like normal, but the middle pickup actually goes up here to one of the lugs on the three-way toggle switch or something. I'm not really quite too sure how the wiring goes, but that's the way it looks to me. And the way that it felt taking that middle pickup out because the wires just went up here. It's like, well, what's that doing? But when I got this guitar, there's a bunch of stuff shaking around in here. I think it was either old polishing compound or just little chips of wood. They were stuck right here in the output jack area. So I got that all cleaned out. Don't have to worry about that anymore. So cool. On the back, no access heel joints or anything crazy like that. But we do have the thin binding in the cutaway. So that means you can kind of see that light finish check where the maple cap actually ends but that's really not even that prevalent. Usually these white finishes, they heavily finish check. And the fact that this one doesn't have that is kind of a miracle because most of the ones that I've seen do have it. We've got the gold output jack plate here and take a look at this gold diamond posi lock strap lock buttons. That's pretty late for those things to be stock, but pretty much all of them have it that I've seen. And of course we've got one up here, just a very cool shortly lived 80s Gibson part. And then moving up the back of the neck here, not too much to talk about, but we can see our serial number. This one ends in 546, so two behind the latest serial number that is currently known to us. And of course, that Custom Shop Edition decal. Now what's kind of cool is you can see a remnant of what appears to be a shop sticker right here. Sometimes shops would put a sticker right there to identify the guitars that were theirs. Unfortunately, somebody removed it. It's kind of a cool thing to have on there because then you can trace the lineage of it or at least know where this thing ended up in the first place. But pretty much the only finish checking I see on this guitar is right here on that low E tuner. 
It was likely just caused by some stress of this tuner. So if that's all you got, that's not bad because all the other ones I've seen, they've got it all up the neck and whatnot. And here's another measurement here on the bench, 1.78 inches, including the maple top. So about 1.8 inches. So it is not a full width of Les Paul, and that's why this belongs within the Studio Custom family. Because if it was a full width Les Paul, then it would just be, you know, a weird conglomeration of parts without an official title. But hey, we know what this thing is now, and I'm so proud that I was able to, you know, write this part of Gibson history and, you know, remind people what this thing was actually supposed to be called. And initially, this video was just going to be me naming it with my best educated guess as to what it is, but I'm so thankful that Randy was also able to confirm that is indeed what this was. Honestly, I'm just surprised that dealers, you know, didn't realize it before. And I think the real reason is because they wanted to get top dollar for something. And if you call it a studio, how are you going to do that? But I don't even care if it's actually a studio. These things are sweet. Now, if you're surprised about the whole mahogany body thing, remember, only the first two years of the studios had the alder. But the fact that this one doesn't have the alder body makes me believe that maybe it wasn't just an old blank. Maybe they purposefully decided to make a really fancy XPL version and maybe they didn't sell too well. I'm, I'm not sure. I can't imagine this thing not selling. I would love to team up with Gibson, have them duplicate this guitar and do a custom shop run of like a hundred of them because I guarantee you they would sell even at custom shop prices. Because getting a vintage original just really isn't an option because most people that own them, they don't want to sell them, even if you offer them crazy money. Well, what's kind of nice is the Studio Customs actually have a cult following, so now they have a new king to worship. <laughs> oh, Studio Custom XPL, I love you. 8 pounds, 12.9 ounces, so right under 9 pounds here. What a cool guitar. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how this beauty sounds. Thank you. 
Now that we know all about the Gibson Les Paul Studio Custom XPL, what are my final thoughts on this thing? I am completely infatuated, not only just because of the whole rarity factor, but this is a fantastic playing and sounding instrument. I kind of touched on this a little bit on the workbench, but I really want to talk more about this neck profile. So it starts off kind of like that medium 60s profile right here, but it's nice and rounded at the same time, meaning the neck shape itself is rounded, not necessarily chunky. But it's kind of like those 65 Melody Makers, how I tell you that they get fatter up here. It fills out so much. It's just such a fantastic neck profile. Honestly, it's unlike any other neck profile I've had from this particular time period. And I've forgotten just how much I like the three pickup setup when it's a simple three-way toggle switch. Because that middle position, I mean, you're used to it being kind of a chimey sound. Why not have it be, you know, single coil-esque? It just makes this thing, you know, a more versatile instrument. But, you know, at the same time, you also have a middle pickup. They look really cool, but sometimes it can get in your way while picking. And that's kind of the case on this one because, I mean, it's really up there. Of course, you could deck that down really far if that really bothers you. But I I thought the tones were too good to really mess with. These pickups are really microphonic too, so when you tap them with your pick, you'll hear it. They'll squeal if you have a bunch of distortion on, but for the most part, I didn't have any troubles playing the guitar as is. But I'm sure if you've got like this giant stack of amps, yeah, playing this thing live, maybe not so much. Not without wax potting the pickups, but that would be such a terrible waste of these Tim Shaws. The tones out of this thing, the neck pickup. Almost a little bit too dark and punching sometimes. I really had to take that pickup down a little bit. It was really fighting. But that bridge pickup, it's got good bite. Nice for some distortion tones. But I honestly preferred the clean settings out of this guitar the most. For whatever reason, I wanted to play the doors on this. And you could also do like some jazzy things. It's definitely not a traditional guitar, but man, does it sound good. However, this does not actually feel like a regular Les Paul Studio Custom. Those have a very distinct feel to them. They're usually nice and lightweight. This one feels a little bit chunkier in the body. That's probably because you got an additional pickup. You got the TP6 tailpiece and all this other stuff. And this all white finish just does not make it look as thin as it is. And maybe it's just because my two favorite Gibson guitars are Explorers and Les Pauls that I've fallen in love with this thing, but I love having this headstock on there. It's just great for attacking people with. And in theory, the Explorer headstock has slightly better straight string pull than the Les Paul style, except for your low E is at such an angle, that's the one that I had to keep tuning. <laughs> but as far as somebody that wants to do a bunch of soloing with one of these things, I think it's perfect for that. I like playing this thing too much. I'm scared I'll damage it. I mean, this one's in too clean of shape. So. so who knows? Maybe I will contact Gibson, see if they want to make me a custom shot version of one of these so I don't have to be scared of playing it. Short of that, I guess you could buy a regular Les Paul Studio Custom, splice an Explorer headstock on it by chopping off the Les Paul one, refinish it, route it for that third pickup. I mean, there technically is a way to make one of these out of an existing guitar if you got the know-how and skill because occasionally you can find a studio custom that has the ebony board. And one last compliment to this instrument, this pick guard. It still shows fingerprints, but it's not as bad as like modern day mirrored guards. It's really easy to clean them off. And here it is 36 years later and it's still holding up pretty good. So let's go ahead, pop over to the blacklight and see if uh, I made a bad investment on this one or not. Hopefully we're good. Oh, would you take a look at that? The pick guard glows an orange color. You know, I wonder if that's because the pick guards actually absorbed a bunch of UV light or if it's just the material underneath that. I mean, you can see the knobs glow a little bit, but honestly, you can't even tell. It looks like we're all set for the top. Everything's looking the way I would want to see. Everything's looking nice along our edges as well. Looks like uh, maybe this took some time on a stand. You can see some light stand rash, but, but thankfully it's not the eyesore kind. I did not even see that in regular lighting situations. And the back here is also looking just as good. One thing I do want to touch upon, the thin binding in the cutaway is not like most studio customs. So that's something that this thing kind of has going towards historic specs. That doesn't necessarily exist on its brother model. 
and thankfully no finish worn off the neck yet, but it is a little bit sticky feeling, so I could see it. The only damage I can really report is the finish is kind of chipped off the edge of the nut right there. But at least the side that you see while you're playing, it's still over top of that, so that's all good. That's cool. I like that headstock. <laughs> And then back here, I'm surprised we do not see an outline where that shop sticker is. I mean, so maybe it was actually something else, who knows? Because when this was first listed by the initial dealer, you could still see the residue, but then the second dealer cleaned it off, and then I did some additional cleaning to this one. But cool, everything's looking good here. Let's check out the original case. Here's the original case for one of these. It's kind of interesting, because I don't think I've ever seen this for anything else. Uh, Even the double cut Les Pauls are a little bit different than this. But that's the one thing I hate, is I have to deal with one of these cases instead of being able to put my beautiful guitar in a chainsaw case, because that Explorer headstock makes it not fit. But one latch, two, three, and unfortunately our bottom one is missing, but the back latch is still present and the handle is still there. But the interior is a nice blue color, but the lid does not support itself anymore. That's why for the B-roll shots, I had to borrow my lift-in case from something else. But good heel support, very tiny compartment. And uh, honestly, it's just an empty bag in there. So just a pretty basic case for this one. Troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed this very rare look at the Studio Custom XPL. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this one, uh, yeah, good luck with that. You're going to have to offer me a whole boatload of money. Like, if you think I'm going to sell this thing for 12 grand, <laughs> no. I mean, maybe 50. If you want to offer me 50, I would take it. But other than that, yeah, I think I'm going to hold on to this thing because, yeah, fantastic guitar. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.